Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. So, on today's live stream, I welcome back Tulio Delaquia from Reef Bright. What's going on there, Tulio? How you doing, Keith? Good to see you, man. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. Um, so Tulio has been on the show several times, and he is a lighting guru who has spoken at many trade shows and conferences about lighting. He uh, was a very instru uh, instrumental, right, Tulio, in helping to develop LEDs for aquarium use. That's kind of one of your uh, claim to fame there. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I basically was kind of the, uh, the grandfather, if you will, long, you know, before Ecotech and AI and these guys. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I definitely, uh, let's say I definitely had an influence in LED technology in our industry and, and actually manufactured a lot of products for PFO and the original ice cap and many, you know, companies, LED based products and other things like that. So, so yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, I think we'll uh, I think we'll probably talk about LEDs. You know, probably I would think. Well, and and here's the thing, before, and 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 we won't derail. I'm going to be good tonight. <laughs> uh, but the to the people watching, I I only ask that you consider the Keith. Listen, you've known me for a long time. Okay, I've been working with LEDs for how long, Keith? A long, a long time. time. So my point is, is some of the things we're going to discuss tonight. It, 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 you know, we, right, we sell LEDs. You see what I mean? So it's just we're trying to understand what some of the new data we've kind of, you know, come across, what that all means, you know, what that all means. We're not just, you know, so 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 that being the case, you know, yeah, I've been, been working with LEDs at least a couple of weeks. Yeah, a couple of weeks. <laughs> All right. So before we start chatting with Tulia, I want to thank the sponsors for the show, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Really appreciate their support, and I also appreciate all you folks out there that are tuning in. And as always, please uh, drop your questions and comments in the chat. I see there's a whole bunch of comments and a couple of questions already in the uh, in the chat. I thank you for that. And uh, don't forget to uh, hit that like button. We've we've got close to 50 people watching right now. Only 13 likes. We got to bump that up there, folks. So if you wouldn't mind uh, hitting that like button and subscribe to the channel while you're at it. 
you know, what, what, what the heck. Um, so, so Tulio, I know we've covered this before on the live stream, but can, can we start off tonight by, you know, you giving the audience a, uh, a brief primer on lighting, you know, in terms of what they should be considering to light their tanks? You know, let's call it like a lighting 101 discussion. I think it would be kind of a good starting point for a chat tonight. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, a good way to look at it. You know, you have par, you have all these different things. Um, one of the things, one of the things that's come to light, pun intended, um, is the adaptive nature of corals. Okay. So, um, you know, spectrally, you, you know, some of that importance, many corals, again, depending on the type of corals, we can't talk all corals in one group, but your general, let's say, easy to keep or, or your, your beginner, what I would call your beginner corals, most of those guys are pretty adaptive and, and, and they're going to kind of thrive. And, and, and you, you know this yourself, Keith, under whatever you put them under, um, as long as the amount of light is, is modest, you know, uh, uh, is modest in that sense. Um, and, and you're using the appropriate light source, meaning something typically designed for an aquarium, you're going to be in that ballpark, if you will. The difference becomes when you start getting into more demanding corals and more complex setups. I mean, truth be told, Keith, you and I both know you can keep an awesome tank with a couple of simple lights and some water flow. It just depends on how complicated and how complex you want to get. Yeah, no, it, uh, I think that's one thing that a lot of folks um, sometimes uh, m might overlook is that simplicity sometimes wins out in terms of just yeah. having so many different, um, you know, variables in play. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, Tulio, I think one thing that always, you know, kind of um, you, you see a lot of people talking about is is par, 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 you know, and I'm getting this amount of par for this light and should SBS be you know, in a certain par range and, and LPS and, and torches and all that stuff. And, and it just seems like people lean very heavily on par, not necessarily spectrum. There, it's, there's always a concern about, um, you know, par. And um, could, could you uh, just kind of give us your perspective in terms of leaning on par as a, an evaluation tool for light, different light sources? It's, 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 it, it's funny, I, I was doing the work, you and I were talking about this before we went live. I was doing a workshop and essentially this question came up and I stumbled upon a very good explanation to allow people to visualize uh, par in essence, meaning think of it as if we have a jar and we fill this jar with marbles, okay? The jar is filled with marbles. Each one of them marbles represents a photon, okay? That's essentially par. It's counting photons. So it knows how many marbles are in the jar. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't know how many are blue, how many are red, how many are green. It depends on the distribution of said energy. And that's the way energy works, whether it's a LED, a metal halide or whatever, it's gonna convert X amount of electricity to light energy. The difference is gonna be you can't compare it with just par. The difference is going to be how that total energy is distributed over the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's where we start to find some, some interesting things going on as of late, now that we're better able to measure and monitor those types of things. So in terms of par, the best use for par, this is how I try to explain it to people. Again, assuming that the source that you're using, this could be T5, it could be LED, just assuming that the source that you're using is appropriate for aquariums, you know, it's appropriate for aquariums, and you have a, a let's say, a modest or, or, or your PAR is in the range, the usefulness of PAR is really in terms of monitoring the light source itself, meaning if you measure your PAR and let's say it's 150, okay, great. It's not the actual number. If you come back in six months from now and you measure your par and it's now 100, you know your light source is now degraded 33% and you probably want to replace your lamps or check one of your lights to see if it needs to be repaired or something of that nature. But that's the simple thing with par. And I'd like to point out in, in memory 
of the, the, the late, great Jake Adams, because we used to talk about this all the time. When you express par, so in other words, the, it's 150, it's PPFD. The PPFD is 150. Saying the par is 150 is actually not correct. That's like saying my speedometer says 60. So PPFD is photosynthetic photon flux density. So that's what you're expressing. So you'd say, hey, if your PAR meter is reading 305, the PPFD is 305. So why, why is PAR still like a term that we uh, see and hear all the slang. time? Slang. No, slang. Just like PER, which if you really think about per. it, PER is meaningless. I, I really, I, I want think about this. Aren't the needs of corals, Keith, would you agree that the needs of corals can vary a lot Yeah. in terms of lighting and other things like that? Yep. So how can you express PER? You would have to have a, a standard or a measurement for each. It, it just doesn't add up. It's just one of these things that kind of sounds cool, but when you really break it all down, what does it mean? Yeah. I hear you. Um, uh, we got a bunch of folks out there watching. What's up there, Amanda and Chris Meckley, Jason Langer? What's going on, guys? Chris is, dude, Chris is, is ACI, yeah. Yeah. A lot of love for those folks. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be mentioning uh, ACI a few times on this uh, on this live stream. <laughs> uh, Andy Bauman. Uh, Andy's uh, question, how does PAR and or spectrum impact the likelihood of pest microbes, uh, for example, cyano and, and dinos? <laughs> It can actually it can have a big effect. And, 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 and here's how and why. Here's how and why. Oftentimes we think of things in what I call absolutes, meaning that some of the indirect effects of light is that, for example, true full spectrum light sources, a lot of microfauna benefit from it. For example, Keith, here's my question for you. If we wanted to grow phytoplankton or other good stuff for our tank, would we use a blue light or a white light? I personally use a, um, a full spectrum white light. But that just a white light in general, right? Yeah. So the point is, is that the use of, of certain types of light sources, more full spectrum, can promote can promote beneficial organisms. There's tons of phototropic microorganisms in our water column. That, that, that play important roles that we often take for granted or get filtered out with the uh, filter rollers and all the other stuff going on there. So again, it's a constant balancing act, but absolutely microorganisms respond to light, all of them, good ones and bad. And the good ones are supposed to keep the bad ones in balance. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, does, does that mean that a certain type of lighting can help fight those kind of pests? In essence, yes, and here's why. Here's why. And again, okay, so now we're getting into a little bit of the UV stuff. And, and Keith, you know I'm very conservative about this because, guys, you have to understand there's, there's safety involved here because UV is not to be played with, and I mean that. Okay, as someone who works with light, UV is not to be played with. Uh, and so uh, get, Let's get even more specific, uh, <clears throat> Tulio. You're talking about UVA, UVB. Um, UVB is the all part, of all of them. All of them. Okay. UVA and UVB. Okay. Because you can listen to, you can have too much UVA exposure too. It's perfectly safe. It's per, it's called solar radiation. And I'm gonna it's, um, it's, I'm gonna show a chart here that uh, Jim Telegram sent me. Thanks, Jim. And this is a uh, this is the uh, the spectrum here that we're looking at, Tulio, and it's basically showing the visible light spectrum from the 380 nanometers up to the 780 nanometers. And then uh, before that, that's the visible light. And then before that, we've got the, um, the UVB and the UVA at the 280 nanometers and the, and the 315 uh, nanometers. So that's, that's what you're talking about in terms of kind of like the X-ray. And then even there's Y rays before the, uh, the X-rays. Well, no, no, no. They're not nowhere near x-rays. UVB and UVA is well within the, the, the uh, you have UVC. I think that's the one you're thinking of. Uh, maybe this chart is not exactly, um, maybe I'm reading it wrong. 
Yeah, yeah, that could basically, in short, you have your UVC, which goes from 200 to 280. Now, that's typically absorbed in the upper atmosphere, ozone layer, yada, 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 yada. So we are typically exposed from 280 and above. Okay. So 280 to 320 is considered UVB, 320 to 400 considered UVA, 400 to 700 typically considered visible yep. light. Okay, gotcha. Um, what was my, um, uh, okay. So I'm, uh, I'm a little, I'm a little flustered here, Tulio. I'm trying to like, uh, handle, uh, multiple things or just looking at some comments and, and thank you stories Reef, for that super chat. Rashid, appreciate that, man. Tulio, the comment is Tulio is a genius and it's been an absolute pleasure getting to pick his brain exclamation point. <laughs> I paid him to say that Keith. I paid him to receive. Thank you, brother. I, I, you know, I love you guys, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so dude, let me, um, you and I had a conversation a while ago. I don't know when this was maybe like a month or two ago. And, uh, okay. it, so th this is again, talking about par and, and trying to determine like what light source potentially used to have the most effective results for growing corals, specifically in my case, SPS. Um, so the scenario that I threw at you was this one. Let's say um, you got one tank that's lit by metal halides. And you've got another tank that's lit by LEDs. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, so this is a real case scenario between two of my display tanks. Um, so I've got the GHL Mitras as the LEDs over my peninsula tank. And I've got um, currently I have the um, 400 watt 20K radium bulbs, two of those over my, uh, my other display tank supplemented by T5s. A while ago, I haven't taken the PAR readings recently, but a while ago, I was probably getting twice as much PAR out of the LEDs as I was versus the, um, the halides and the T5s, you know, and, and, um, the, and, and, and the, the PAR readings I was getting under my meters back when I took these, um, levels was around, 300 to 350 at the bottom to almost 500 in the top of the of the tank and it's a 20 inch tall tank the other tank my readings were probably 150 at the bottom of the tank and this is the halide lit tank and, and and maybe up to 250 possibly 300 at the top which is a 24 inch um tall tank now the growth of the sps and i know there's a lot of factors in play but i i do i am pretty consistent between the two systems in terms of you know, how I, uh, what I dose and, and what I like to keep the key parameters at and flow and all that sort of thing. But there are variables in play, right? I mean, even if you're doing the same kind of methodology, there will be differences between two different systems for sure. Um, so what would you say then between the two tanks? If, um, if I'm getting those kind of results with the LEDs over that peninsula tank, it are... LEDs in that case going to be a better choice over the 187 gallon tank with the metal halides because the par is twice as high. And I remember my I remember my response to you. I remember my response to this question. So, for example, the older halide systems, the older or I should say the older mentality with halides was when you needed more light, you ran a 400 watt. It was just throw more wattage at it. You had one fixture, you just threw more wattage at it, and there it was. And 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 we talked about a theoretical three, 400 watt setup. So I would have been using 1200 watts here, and you had your six mitras, and so you'd, again, you would have been at your equivalent about 1200 watts. And you got a I good memory, dude. Well, because the, 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 the data kind of the watt and, and distribution of energy, it really doesn't kind of change. But what I suggested was not saying that the LEDs weren't doing fantastic for you. But if you taken, for example, divided that up to six to 50 metal halides, yes, you would have used a few more watts. But what the total gain would be. And that's what we noticed, for example, when we did that live measurement with Polar Reef was that, yes, we did use 35 more watts, but we were getting more PPFD. So if you gave that back, and, and, and again, it was the, the but, but to your question, uh, to your question about the microorganisms, what I was getting at is, is that uh, 
I was recently at a conference last year called the IUVA. It's the International Ultraviolet Association. And these are the guys, listen, look them up. These are the guys who dealt with COVID. So the guys there were like Department of Homeland Security and, and, and all these other people that were there because UV runs a whole, there's applications with UV that, that just, it's mind boggling, all the different uses and applications for UV. And this conference was like the magna for UV and what have you. The reason why we were there is because our poster was accepted with, and it was vetted by the way, using one of our solar radiation light sources, which was just a mercury vapor source, at two feet from the source, we effectively killed E. coli and, and a host of other stuff, fungi and, and things like that. So what happens is, again, we think about everything in absolute, for example, with UV. With UV, even with nature, it's not about killing, it's about control. It's about viral load. If you have a fish, for example, and it's exposed to X number of, you know, the viral load is, let's say, 10. No big deal. The fish can deal with that. But if the viral load is 10,000, that's when the fish becomes overcome with infection. And in nature, so a lot of times it's just a natural kind of control mechanism. It's not that it's killing everything, but, but it's helping to control because in truth, most of it in nature is actually being absorbed by the phytoplankton because they noticed this when they took scientific measurements at the reef, as well as out in the open ocean, that the penetration at the reef was a lot less down. It was only down to like three meters where they could measure UVB at 1%. Um, and that's because the phyto was absorbing it, whereas out in the open ocean, it was 11 meters. So the point is, is I'm not making any statements with UV, but if this is what's going on in nature, I, I, I'm excited to start asking more questions because maybe there is a natural control mechanism we've been looking, not for all cases, but, but, but for some cases. So, you know, getting back to that question, Tulio, you know, when, and, and, and you made a good, um, you, you mentioned something I failed to mention is that basically what, um, the, between the two scenarios I was describing in terms of the halides versus the LEDs over the uh, the tanks, though the watts were essentially equal, right? So assuming the same wattage, and you've got twice the amount of par for uh, for the LEDs versus the halides, um, why why would halides still be a, a potentially better choice for lighting the um, the tank that still has the halides on it? Well, for SPS coral, here's the thing for an SPS system. One of the main benefits for an SPS system, phytoplankton, phytoplankton. The halides would absolutely promote better phyto growth just because of the red and the other, it's, it's, it's just <laughs> the spectral data is available. The red, it's what you would use to grow phyto. And we know that SPS historically love halides anyway. We do know that it's just back then. Think about it, Keith. We didn't talk about light the way we do now. We didn't express it the way we do now. Now that we know better, I guess is a good way to put it. I would totally redesign that system. You might be able to get away with six 175 watt moguls if they had the correct reflectors. Because again, like Sanjay says, the watt is the watt. Right. And a photon is a photon. It's just how things are distributed. So how, how important are the reflectors in terms of LED fixtures versus halide fixtures? Obviously, with halides, you've got... In general, it, it, optics, reflectors, it's everything. It's everything. It, it's the difference between something that's going to cut like a knife through something or something that's just going to, you know, disperse very evenly. So, uh, yeah, Alex Correa. What's up there, Alex? Um, makes a good Alex, comment. Alex, how you doing? With the LEDs, the reading of the PAR was concentrated... Uh, the halides offer a better spread. That's why the readings were different. Um, right, and you mentioned that too, Tulia, in our uh, private conversation a while ago, is that um, the LEDs have a more of a, a focused, um, you know, they, they focus the light better. But, I, you know, I, I guess what I keep getting back to is is if you're taking the PAR readings and you're making taking a lot of those readings around the, the tank and you're getting consistently much higher par values versus what you're getting on the halide, you know, lit tank. How, 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 how do you debunk that uh, as a, um... the thing is, is I can't, I'm, unfortunately, Keith, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I by no means am I questioning your measurements. 
But oh again, yeah, that's not the question. Really, I'm, I'm just trying to like you know, un better you know, understand I, the um, the difference. I just know, like I said, I just know, like for example, when we did do the video with Polar Reef, I don't mean to promote somebody else's thing, but ah, when promote, promote away, uh, check it out. But, you know, and, and we we wrote Mark Levinson. He had no idea what was going on, <laughs> but we literally straight up measured a brand new LED out of the box and a, a current. 250 watt halide system, um, and 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 again, even though the, the the halide did certainly edge out the LED, I'll just say that they were equal. Um, again, a lot has to do with the type of fixture, the lamp, the ballast. You know, everything. It anything can be expressed in a perfect world. Yes, and and you know, I think. Ultimately, what you got to look at is the results, right? You got to you got to look at in terms of what what is going on with the corals in the tank, in terms of how they're adapting to that light and how, you know, how fast they're growing and how they're coloring up, right? I mean, basically, that's that's the most important thing to consider is observation in terms of what your corals are digging or not digging. Well, and and it's also the type of tank you want. And what I mean by this, what I mean by this, it really is the type of tank you want. For example, hey. There's nothing wrong with blue LEDs. Keith, come on. I'm a godfather of blue LEDs. It's not, my, it's not my thing, but... No, but you know what I mean, Keith? Let's be real. I'm the godfather of blue LEDs. Nothing wrong with blue LEDs, but it's different types of tanks. So, for example, when you have these blue LED tanks, the colors that you're seeing in your corals, that's fluorescence. That's not color. That's not color. That's fluorescence. OK, and that's where I hear people talking all the time about color, color, color. Well, in the lighting world, if we were talking lighting science, we have a thing called CRI, which is a color rendering index. What colors are supposed to look like under given conditions and by standardized conditions, if you took any one of these corals, obviously they wouldn't look anything but what they did. But it's more importantly, the difference in the action of fluorescence which is basically the, the coral with photons being emitted um, versus just, just, let's say, color, where you're looking at photons being reflected and, and subtractive, meaning what's being absorbed and what's being reflected, and that's what's going to express the color. Um, so, all right, dude, we, um, we've been talking, uh, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, Tulio, um, UV light, UVA, UVB, and all that stuff. Can, can you just give a, um, just a real simple <laughs> overview in terms of what that issue is all about? I know you've been on uh, Polo Reef and, and, um, we've been talking about it on this live stream, but can, can you just, um, give a brief explanation what's going on in terms of the UV light in, uh, halides versus LEDs and, and why that potentially can matter in terms of the help of corals? Well, here's the thing. One thing LEDs, have, basically one thing LEDs in general have, have helped us establish is that corals can, can survive without UV. Okay? No one's saying they can't survive and even do well without UV. Keith, you know that. I never, you know, I, I'm very conservative in my statements. You know that we've we've gone you know we we've, we've gone over this before, um, but but the thing is is that in nature, I will say there's a lot of important action in nature. Um, there's a lot of important actions in, in in even other animals, sea turtles, and 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 so many different other aquatic animals and organisms, um, even with stuff with some of the public aquariums and different things like that. So there's kind of a, a there there. And this is the best way to think about it. This is the best way to think about it. Again, avoiding the absolutes. If we were to take the ocean, if we were to take the ocean, once we got past 10 feet in general, get rid of red, get rid of red. And we know our UV, if anything, it's so diminished, whatever. Right. Mm. So now we're primarily dealing with our, our remnants of green and blue. So then all you have to think to yourself is what organisms are we going to find down there? Because once you start getting down to 15 and 20 feet, as you know, Keith, where's most of the phyto up top? Right. And there's different things. So there's different levels and different tiers in your reef systems. Hence why in nature, corals do the things that they do. But when we put something in a glass box that's only three feet, we kind of totally change that equation. Yeah. 
And that's where you got to be careful because I've had this conversation with people before because that's like being in a little tide pool. Even three feet is nothing for life. Right. So in, in, in terms of, you know, the UVA and the UVB in, uh, in halides versus LEDs. So for, for LEDs, there is, uh, there is some UVA in, in some of the uh, LED fixtures out there. I don't think there's a lot of them out there. I think the GHL Mitra is... It's minimal. The, yeah, the UVA is minimal. And, and, and again, the bottom line is because of the nature, okay? And this gets back to the way... This gets back to the way we want to express things, okay? So even based on... Listen, even based on, let's say, uh, uh, the statement of light, where on average with LEDs, let's say it's 380... Right. Let's say it's 380 to, you know, let's say, well, most of the stuff I've measured, like the the the, the more popular fixtures on the market yeah. was about 700 nanometers was the cutoff. And that's what we found on the polar reef video. So if we said that, Keith, and we had our theoretical watt and with that theoretical watt, we produced one photon. We produced one photon at each wavelength from 380 to 700 nanometers, how many photons would we have? 320. Okay. Right? Now, my same theoretical watt, my same theoretical watt, radiometrically, that same theoretical watt with a mercury vapor source, I'm going to produce light from 280 to easily 800 and beyond. But I'll stop. I'll stop at 8. That I've got 140 more photons. So even if it was just a photon for photon thing, it, it's how we express it. Radiometrically, radiometrically, mercury vapor sources do produce more light. Even Sanjay will agree with that. It's a more full spectrum. It's, yes, yes, more full spectrum. It's how we express the data now. And Keith, I think you and I discussed this. My the reason for this data is not to bash LEDs. My company sells a lot of them. Why would I want to bash LEDs? Okay. The thing is, is now that we understand that corals can in fact thrive without UV, that corals can in fact be as adaptive as they are, and some of these other things, there's a whole bunch of other cool questions that we could and should be asking. Yeah, I mean. So I think what you're referring to is the lack of UVB and LEDs, right? So yeah. there's there's a uh, there's a lot of um, awesome tanks out there. I've got I've got LEDs and and um, they lack the UVB, and uh, you know the corals are thriving in that tank, and 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 uh, that's the case in the other tanks with uh, with LEDs. Many many uh, tanks that have uh, LEDs. So why why? Um, so I see Amanda Meckley made the comment. I think you just also said this, uh, Tula. Maybe corals can just adapt, period. Maybe certain species don't adapt as well. There are so many variables that can contribute. I feel like this debate will last way past my time on this planet. So, uh, yeah, I mean, why why is UVB important for corals? I mean, is there any research out there that says that it is? There is. There is. And I've showed Sanjay the paper. When we were at Andrews, I showed Sanjay the paper. There, there, there's so many... Again, this is like an onion, like like Amanda and Chris said, we could peel this onion all night long. The thing is, is that I think the difference with some of the tanks, think about this, Keith, because again, we've been around tanks for at least a couple of weeks, okay? The, the tanks of old, we didn't have the filtration we do now. We didn't have the efficacy in terms of skimmers. We didn't have the efficacy in terms of filtration for, for particulates and all these other things with these fleece filters and all, you know, all the other advances that we kind of have. OK, so I think the fact that corals have been able to thrive without UV is because we're already naturally controlling pests in this closed loop environment. But in nature, that's not the case. If you took away all of those safeguards and we were talking about seawater and we were talking about X and we were talking about then things completely change again. And I think that's also a big difference with tanks of today, because back when, Keith, if you think about it, we never talked about UV as much and nobody ran their covers on their halides. So corals were getting plenty of UVA and UVB. 
We just were never aware enough to measure for it or, or, or pay attention to it. So you, um, you do um, believe that coral pathogens could be more um, likely in a tank that's lit by LEDs that don't have the UVB, UVA as much versus the uh, halides? You know, I am no biologist, so I'm not going to make that claim. But I will say this. I will say this. If it's a skin, if it's on top of the, especially see, because you will get penetration. And remember what I told you, again, distance from the source, yeah. energy level, there's a number of factors, but um, it is possible. And that's what I'm hoping Chris Meckley and, and, and uh, even Andrew Sandler, and, and we, we, we've been discussing and talking about a way to do an actual scientific measurement. And, 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 and in fact, because I believe there is good potential for that. Uh, Bert Minshew makes this comment. I've seen as many cited studies that UVB is absolutely harmful to coral. It's all um, in who you ask. I'm definitely off the fence on the UVB, even for the tank water itself. Um, Andy's asking, um, what controls pathogens then for corals deeper than 10 feet in the ocean? Other pathogens. Number of pathogens. You know, any number of conditions. You know, that's the thing. In nature, you have as many good organisms as you do bad organisms. That's how our immunosystem and our bodies work. So in nature, you have that natural balance. And again, at the surface, at the surface, it's just a, it, it's a control. It's not a killing agent. It's a control agent. Right. I mean, uh, if we wanted to, to, to utilize that with, uh, with, you know, to, to help control pathogens, shouldn't we all be running uh, UV sterilizers? Well, and, and, and it, exactly. I never, I never commented, I never said to use the lights for um, that, but, but it might be an effective treatment. It might, in fact, be an effective treatment. We don't know. We don't know if we just keep getting into this absolute malarkey and, and until we ask those questions. But it's been scientifically proven that at a distance, solar radiation can kill bad stuff. So now let's find out what we can kill safely, of course, safely, because Mother Nature is, in fact, doing it. So, for example, Keith, let me ask you this question. In nature, are there some SPS corals that come out of the water? Uh, well, yeah, I think uh, when the tides are uh, moving. And they spend a substantial yeah. amount of time in direct sunlight, yeah. right? Yeah. So here's my question for you. What do you think happens to a lot of those parasites and other things that may be on that acro at that time? Where do you think they're going? It's flee or die. Yeah. And that's how nature works. It's not absolutes. Maybe it only controls in this range. And then beyond that, mother takes over in a different mechanism. But it's not a total or absolute thing. But to say that UVB has no importance in nature is ridiculous. It's how we get vitamin D. Right. Yeah. Without UVB, there's no vitamin D. There's no vitamin K. Uh, there, there's so many instances where UV plays a critical role in nature. Uh, another question I had for you, uh, Tulio. Why, why aren't uh, why why don't uh, LED fixtures have the UVB? You know, I mean, some do have the UVA, but is it just too dangerous to have degradation them? expense? Degradation and expense. Good quality UV LEDs are extremely expensive. Uh -huh. I mean, ridiculously off the chart expensive. When you think of how many you have to use to make a fixture and go into production and, and sell through, you know, companies like BRS, for example. So production is one degradation is another thing because the materials needed to work with such LEDs. Now you're talking about special glass, you're talking about special materials, because otherwise it would all start breaking down. Yeah, we got a little bit debate going on in the, uh, the chat here. Alex and uh, Andy, uh, Alex is saying UV sterilizer will only kill pathogens in the water column. The pathogens located on substrate won't be affected. Andy, Alex, Korea, and in a recirculating system, the surface bacteria are also in the water column. So, yeah, I mean, I, in, in terms of trying to understand the impact of bacteria on our systems, it, it, it just it kind of blows the mind, you know. I think that um, we've had a lot of discussions in this live stream. There's been a lot of discussions out in the reef keeping community about all the STN and RTN events and, 
and uh, you know treatment options and and what potentially can um, you know help in that vein. It's uh, it's tough, man. You know because there's it's a, it's a mystery in terms of what the causes are in terms of RTN and STN. Here's what I would suggest. Listen, I like. If, if, if we can't move forward, right, Keith, and you and I, whenever we've done these talks, I always like to leave people with something they can take home with them, if you will. OK, here's what I ask. If you want to play with UV and I do not recommend it, but if you want to play with UV, OK, minimally, minimally buy yourself a Ferguson meter. OK, Ferguson meter, they're about 250 bucks on Amazon. And this way you can determine what your exposure is because you do not want to be over a four. Uh, I, I would say four, even though theoretically the, the meter six, seven. But but the thing is, is this way you would know. I do not recommend it because, again, we don't understand the actions in a closed system yet. OK, we don't understand the actions. But guess what? That light is, in fact penetrating, because that's one thing that I, I forgot to mention, Keith, is remember how we were talking about uh, I was doing that workshop and Alexander Graf from Abyss happened to be at this conference yeah. and was watching me do the workshop and was filming it. When I was measuring underwater, the mercury vapor source that we were testing, which was used for UVB for sea turtles and penguins and things like that, at three feet underwater, we had no problem we had no problem getting readings with the spectrometer. We were getting plenty of UV down there. But again, it's based on the source. It's based on the application. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what you're saying in terms of UVB and, and, and LEDs, it's just not it's just not, not economical to manufacture lights with the UVB. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I don't think it's. Listen, I'll, I'll, I, listen, Keith, you know me. I've always I've always called it straight. I'm not saying it's necessary, but for some corals, it may actually be beneficial because we've seen certain instances of this. Remember, not all corals, not all corals are the corals we think of. You know, you have a various host of different invertebrates and other things like this um, that we would find in said systems. Um, so, so again, there, there is potential benefit. And again, until we test for that, we're not going to know. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think um, it, 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 it definitely, you know, helps to have data research behind what we're, uh, we're talking about here in terms of scientific evidence to, to help us better understand this stuff as hobbyists. Right. Well, the advantage is, the advantage is, the advantage is what we did, what we did at Andrew Sandler's, that was a calibrated ocean optics flame spectrometer. That was all calibrated equipment. And in terms of when you're measuring absolute irradiance, it's measuring only what it sees. And that's why it worked out so beautifully, because guess what? If you did the test over and over again, you're going to get the same result because it's all about energy conversion and distribution. It's not going to change. The set, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. When, when, when you see the signature difference, the signature difference between the sources, and we didn't even measure T5 because T5 has its own signature in itself. Right. And there's people that have seen benefit. Listen, there's people that have seen benefit when they added T5s to LED systems. So is that saying that LEDs weren't complete or that T5s were adding something that the LEDs didn't? There's so many different scenarios where we've seen any one of these light sources be used in, in different ways. Is it possible to to kind of study this and prove this stuff out in a laboratory setting, you know, kind of do some um, control versus exposed type of experiments, you know, just putting uh, sure. LEDs and absolutely halides side by side, absolutely. same kind of corals and, and just absolutely. Is anybody I'll is anybody do doing that? Well, here's the thing. It depends on who does it. So, for example, what we did at Polar Reef, and you can actually Rashid this. I had no idea what them guys were going to do. Just like you, Keith, we talked you came about in this cold. before. I had no idea the questions they were going to ask me. Okay. And Rashid will be the first to tell you that they were skeptical as skeptical can be because that's their job is to be skeptical. 
And they threw everything you could at me but the kitchen sink. But when Andrew seen, because Andrew was right there as I set up the equipment, and so was Mark Levinson and MetroCat and all these people. There was no, it, the equipment was the equipment. So even if you wanted to say so, because we used the same fiber under the same condition, both measurements were still relative to one another. And I even made sure that the light sources were fairly so that the, 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 the emission from the LEDs with the lamp and things like that. But in terms of spectral, the distribution or the signature between the sources, the results are always going to be the same. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm yeah. talking about is kind of like a grow out contest, you know, do uh, do a side by side in a uh, in, in, um, in a tank where you've got. I don't know if it would be two different tanks or you could do the do the same test in the same tank with just two different lights and one on the left side and one on the right side and just kind of do a grow out contest and see uh, where you get the better results, you know, where the corals are healthy. It have to be two. It almost have to be two separate systems. And here's why you wouldn't want the any potential benefit of, let's say, some of the phyto or some of the other stuff that you might get in the halide based system. Who knows? You know, who knows? But but the fact remains, the fact remains is that radiometrically, let's get this clear, folks, radiometrically, metal halides produce more than LEDs per watt, radiometrically. Anyone can claim anything. LEDs are not full spectrum. Anyone that's ever stated that an LED is in full spectrum, let's just say that that I would suggest enhanced spectrum, but they're not the spectrum you know, they're not full spectrum. So radiometrically, the halide does produce more power per watt. Even Sanjay admitted this. You can't deny it. It's physics. It's the way energy is expressed. Right. So if you're running LEDs and you're running 100% of each channel, that uh, what you're saying is that's still not going to be full spectrum versus what you can get out of halides. Right. Right. Because you're still going to get the same signature. And that's what we demonstrated. Right. And Andrew, actually, Andrew Sandler can tell you, because when we measured his max specs and we measured the, the other lights, he saw a similar signature. That's the signature, the emission. That's the nature of how LEDs produce their energy. That's the way light works. T5s, if you looked at the nature of how they produce their energy, they have a completely different signature. Eric uh, Rashia is saying we should have Tilio play devil's advocate and argue why LEDs are better than metal halides. <laughs> they, I can make arguments why LEDs All right, let's are. hear it, man. Okay. When I started with LEDs 20 years ago, actually over 20 years, but we'll say 20 years with this industry, the advantage of LEDs is that I could fine-tune lighting systems that had deficiencies because I could supplement with almost razor-like accuracy. That's the benefit of LEDs. Their tunability in a sense. So, so in terms of supplemental lighting, they're still ideal. I mean, I mean that, listen, Reefbright established supplemental lighting yep. in terms of LED. People can hate on Reefbright all they want and that's fine, but it, 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 it's, it's those XHOs that started it all. We were there from the beginning. And it's ironic because now, even with the blades, people are realizing the benefit of that platform. So, so the thing is, is, but LEDs just have a characteristic signature. So they can be, they can be great for tuning. And here's the thing, you want to get certain corals and, and, and colors and things like that to pop? Absolutely LEDs. Bring out the fluorescence. I can show you some serious trips because here's the thing, if you really want your corals to glow and go, if you will, deprive them of light. Turn down your settings. You know where I'm going with that, Keith, because then they're really going to drive because they're still going to want to photosynthesize. I'm not saying, you know, to turn your lights off, but I'm just saying that at those lower intensities, that's where you're going to get some of those ridiculous colors because many of the places that I've been, worldwide and, and, and any of these other places, they're not running par numbers in general, nowhere near what you would think. And, and uh, you know, a lot of those places are running, running LEDs and the corals are spectacular, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that the proof isn't. But, well, you, well, I wouldn't say that because let me tell you something. 
Chris over at ACI has some gorgeous SPS. Well, Chris just he, and I can confidently say his good stuff. His good stuff is under halides. Yeah, I've, 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 and Chris, if I'm wrong, you feel free to correct me, brother. I won't hate no, you, he, but your good stuff is under the. He halides. just made a comment in the chat. Somebody asked this question, um, and his comment to a person who asked a question: Ari, I prefer metal halides first, T5 second, and the LEDs are good for accent lighting. That is the way. That is what we run. Uh, yeah, and I, I've seen it. I've, I've seen it in, in, in person myself. I mean, listen, dude. I I am. Um, I, I've been running metal halides for like thirty years. You know, um, but I've been running LEDs on one of my other tanks. My you know my most recent tank for the last uh, couple of years, and I've never gotten any better results. I mean, I've never seen better growth in colors under LEDs reason, versus halides. The reason is the reason is listen, and I've said this. You know what, Keith? I remember saying this in our last talk. Okay, I remember saying this in our last talk. Halides are not for everybody. Okay, guys, listen. Here's how it worked. Lighting is like a toolbox. Keith, how many different screwdrivers do you have in your toolbox? So many I can't even count them, dude. Your Phillips screwdrivers, do you have one size or you have three or four sizes of Phillips screwdrivers? Multiple. Flathead, the whole yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's no correct tool for every situation, right? And it's how you use said tools. So see, that's the way lighting works. So for example, if I had to put a nail, if I was hanging a picture, Keith, would I use a sledgehammer? No. Okay? So halides are not for everyone or for every system, but there are absolute scenarios where halides can be of benefit, just like, hey, I'll put it out there, even Andrew Sandler's seen the benefit of his tank since he's put halides. Keith, did you ever think you'd ever see the day where halides would be supplementing LEDs? Yeah. Because that's essentially what they did at Polo Reef. And the irony here is, listen, whichever side you lean on, it's all in good fun for one, guys. But 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 I, I heard someone make this comment, and it really speaks volumes. Why are we even still talking about halides and T5s then? If there isn't something there, if they're dead, then why are we even talking about them? And so what I'm saying is that I'm not trying to say which is better or whatever. What I'm saying is that in light, pun again, intended, in light of what we now know, let's start asking different questions. If corals can, in fact, survive without UV, let's see to what extent. Can UV be beneficial in the treatment of certain coral diseases? We don't know that, but let's find that out. These are just questions we could ask. There's no harm. That you know, all we can do is learn from that. What about the um, the likelihood that manufacturers will stop manufacturing metal halide bulbs? Let, let's say in five years, what's the possibility of that happening? Well, here's the thing. First of all, in our warehouse, we have thousands of bulbs. Of all Are those types. all going to Chris Meckley at ACI? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Okay, guys, halides are not going to take, LEDs are here to stay. Okay, LEDs are here to stay. Yeah. Okay, but I will say this. Halides are important for other animals like sea turtles and penguins where, they had, where there has been beneficial use from their full spectrum light. OK, again, a lot of public aquariums are actually using mercury vapor sources. In fact, Fish and Wildlife themselves recommends to public aquariums and zoos that they provide their animals with some UV, UVB as well. OK, so these light sources are important. If you're not using them for your tank at home, that's fine. But these lights are important for other animals. And, and, and radiometrically, like I said, they do have their benefits. You know, but in general, I would say that most people's tanks are better suited with LEDs. They got a slimmer profile. People love controlling stuff. And that's the joke. Because you know something, Keith? It takes weeks for corals to adapt to any changes you make in your lighting. And they really don't care. They're going to adapt. They're very adaptable. That whole platinum spectrum thing doesn't exist. They're going to adapt to what they got to work with. They really are. Yeah. Um, 
So what do you think, dude? I mean, what, what will, will manufacturers still have a, um, a reason to manufacture metal halide bulbs? I know we will. I know we will. I don't know about other manufacturers because they abandoned the technology a long time ago. I couldn't abandon. Listen, Keith, the one thing I have, the one thing I have, and, and, and again, because you've known me for so long, the one thing I have is my experience with lighting. Right. And the one thing I've, I've never I've always shot straight when it comes to lighting. I could never give up on halides because I just knew that they were too beneficial. Yeah. I just knew that they were too beneficial. And now we have a lot of animals that rely on them. penguins, sea turtles, other animals. You know, yes, there's benefits for corals and there's so many different areas. But again, we keep talking in absolutes. And I think that's the problem, because while we're arguing about this or that, we're not asking more questions. Um, all right. A couple of um, comments and questions from the Super Chat. Rob Upstate, New York. Thank you very much, man, uh, for that Super Chat. The question is, are laser diodes the future? Great chat. OK, laser diodes, no. And I'll tell you why. Uh, and, 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 let, and explain, please, Tulio, what laser diodes are. Well, Here's the thing, an LED is essentially class, many, many LEDs are classified as class two laser devices, okay? The problem with laser diodes is, is the nature of the laser of itself, meaning one of, the, one of the drawbacks of LED, when I talk about focusing, Keith, yep. easiest way to visualize this and, and we've done this before, but for your viewers that weren't privy to these talks, if you could imagine yourself outside on a sunny day and we were having a conversation, if I took a magnifying glass and put it on your arm, you're going to get uncomfortable very quick. It hurt. Has the energy from the sun changed? No, it is not. All I've done is change the focusing of said energy. So that's the way to think about LEDs. They're very focused. Now, this can cause photo inhibition which as you know, LEDs can be notorious for burning corals. And that's one interesting phenomena that we see. For example, in my old tank where I ran halide systems, I remember one time I had an echinata, which was a deep water coral. I exposed that thing to par levels of like 800 or more. And the coral loved it. It was under halides. If I would have did that with a conventional LED fixture, that thing would have been toast. And what it is, is think of it like a, a, a nozzle. This nozzle, we're going to produce one gallon of water, Keith, right? We'll just use a fixed volume, right? Yeah. The difference is I'm going, to, I'm going to distribute that gallon in a big spray at your chest, right? You're going to get wet, right? Or I'm going to focus it into a jet. It's going to hurt, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. That's the way photons work. Yeah. And that's why their distribution is so important. Because they can, in fact, be laser light. Yep. You see this, and it's the focusing nature of LEDs. In fact, quite frankly, and quite frankly, it's why the blade is designed the way it is. They got away from that because they started to realize that. You know me, Keith. I've always said it as it is. That's the problem with LEDs. It's not the it's not the device. It's the handling and the managing and the use of the device. That's where you can really get the tweaks and advantages out of LEDs. Yep. Uh, but it could also be a, uh, a, a downside, too, because if you're tweaking, like you said, corals adapt and all that stuff. But if you're continuously tweaking with LEDs, that's not a good thing either. If your manufacturer gives you a suggested setting, start right about there. And you can typically bet that, you know, you might make some minor adaptation here or there, but... You can bet that that it's reasonably close. I, uh, you know, so when, when I when I started running my LEDs for the you know first time ever running LEDs, it was kind of um, it, it was kind of blowing my mind in terms of how many different uh, options there were in terms of tweaking the spectrum, the intensity, and all that stuff. I was like, Jesus Christ! I mean, with the uh, with, with metal halides and T fives, it's just plug and play. But yeah, but, but you know what? I picked one spectrum, one uh, level of intense. I haven't changed it at all. I just let it be. Yeah, but Keith, here's the thing that you forget to mention. You have the, the fortunate luck of running GHL Mitras, which is a great fixture. 
GHL makes good stuff. I've always been a fan of their company. They know this. You know, GHL makes real good stuff. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's that too. So, so they understand some of this stuff. They understand some of this stuff. I know it. I know they do. And that's why you have the fixtures you do. But again, we can't just say LEDs because your LED system is going to be completely different than XYZ LED system. And, and again, not all LEDs, the devices may be same or similar but their utilization and, and so many other factors make a difference. All right, I just lost, I, speaking of light, I just lost my light here. So let me, uh, uh, all right, I'm gonna be a little darker. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Let there be light. Uh, you know, I saw another comment in the, in the chat that um, is a common misperception, and that is um, uh, Cruz Reef Clan, I have to pay child support. The electric bill for metal halides would kill me. That's not necessarily true, right? A watt as no, as no, the watt is a the watt, watt is a watt. So if you're running the same amount yeah. of watts in halides versus LEDs, the electricity bill is going to be the same. Put it this way: is thirty five. If, if we had if we had a device at two hundred and fifteen watts, right, and we had a device at two at two hundred and fifty watts, that thirty five watts ain't that that that's that's nothing. And I laugh. Here's the thing. And, and I'm not laughing at the person who asked the question. Please don't misunderstand me. The thing I find comical is when it comes to reef tanks, listen, guys will spend a thousand dollars on a frag the size of my pinky and be happy as a clam. And they're going to question it about spending a few cents a month potentially. But guess what? They're using it up in pumps. People don't realize how much power they use in pumps. Hey, Keith, how much how, how many watts are you using in heaters? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, what's the problem? Yeah. 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 Why don't you throw your heaters out? Yeah. That wouldn't be good. I live in Vermont. No, I, but I'm saying but between, between the pumps, the heaters and all the other equipment you're using the lighting. So again, the watt is the watt. And again, the newer halide systems, listen, look up ceramic metal halide lamps. They're more efficient than ever. It's not the only technology that's advanced over the years. So no, in that case, they don't use a lot. And Keith, as you know, because you've had exposure to some of our systems in the past, they don't produce as much heat as people think. No, I've got I've got um, two of your fixtures, uh, Tulio, the um, um, the Reef Bright um, um, hybrid halide fixtures. I got two of the 15 inch fixtures. Is that what it is? With the uh, XHOs on them, and um, I've got two of the uh, old school Luminarch reflectors on another frag tank next to them. And man, I freaking burn myself by putting my hands on that. You know those Luminarch reflect you know, reflectors, whereas your uh, you know um, reflectors, the uh, the fixtures, you can put the hand on it. And you're not going to burn yourself. So yeah, you're, def you're definitely getting yeah. less heat yeah. from that. Um, so uh, Alex Correa is asking, so me, uh, this, this goes to me, what would be the main points you would number in favor of your LEDs comparing to the halides? So, um, you know, I think the key for me in, in terms of what I'm seeing with my GHL Mitras versus the halides is that I'm running six Mitras over this peninsula tank. So I've got six fixtures and the tank is six foot long by three foot wide. I've got really good coverage i mean i think the um I'm, i might get this wrong but um, i think the uh, the recommended coverage you know the what, what those lights can cover individually i believe is 30 inches side to side and 28 inches front to back i might be wrong about that so i've got way more than what uh, is recommended by ghl over my tank and so i think that and combined with the good optics with those uh, fixtures, I think I'm really getting a very good spread on those LEDs. And the um, the spectrum I'm using, which was um, put together by Telegram, Jim uh, Jim Graham, is uh, it mimics 400 watt 20k halides. So it can't. Right, right. It's not. It's it, it mimics it. it, it can. Right. Spectrally, it can't. It's scientifically impossible. Right. It's about as spectrally it can. It's about as close yeah. as it can get. I guess to the human eye, to the human eye, it will appear. It will appear. And again, even other companies that make a claim uh, that hey, no, it's not twenty k. Because if you took a twenty k lamp, I'll listen. I'll go to BRS and I'll do this challenge live. Okay, a twenty k claim on an LED is nothing. 
like a 20K metal halide lamp. Right. Let's just say it's about as... No disrespect to telegram. I'm just saying it's that about as, radiometrically they're different. It's about as close, as I guess, as you can get with LEDs to that spectrum. Um, no, color. Color, yeah. Not spectrum. Color. 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 Two and different it, things. And it, does, and it does look a little bluer to me versus my uh, my halides. You know, it does. Right. It, it's not that crisp uh, white coloration. So I think it's it's a, it's the, the number of fixtures that I have and I think it's um, the good optics on those uh, LEDs, and and um, uh, you know, I and I do think par comes into play because I'm getting twice as much par out of that that uh, on that tank versus the other tank that's lit by uh, by halides, and and you know, it could be the optics on the um, on the reflectors I have. I, I'm I'm using Giesman 24 inch um, Giesman um, Spectra fixtures, so perhaps the um, you know the reflectors in those. Uh, fixtures are not as uh, good as, let's say, a Luminar reflector. Or I used to have the, um, I don't even know how to pronounce it. The, it was an Italian company, Sigfloy. Um, do you know what I'm talking about, Tulio? The, no. Uh, you, you would know what I'm talking about. If I, it, it's spelled S-F-L-I-G something or other. Uh, you can look it up. I mean, I used to have these things. and They, they were beasts, but... Um, they had pretty awesome reflectors in them, and, and you can't find them anyway. They, they don't make them anymore. Well, I think the case, listen, I think simply put, and like I said, you and I discussed this, I think the problem with the halide tank is that the light is poorly distributed. Yeah, I think. I think the light is poorly distributed. I, that That's one of the main, that's, that's what I think the main factors, aside from fixtures themselves, I think it's just poorly distributed. Yeah, and... Um, I, I think that's got something to do with it, Tulio. I do, and and um, you know, I uh, I am gonna put the, uh, the the meters over that tank. You know, I I did uh, I did pick up the meters. I'm gonna put them over that tank, and and um, you know, but I, I I agree with you. I think that might be part of the uh, the issue in terms of the. Um, well, and here's the thing, though, Keith. Again, for your purposes and for your uses, that's probably a good idea. See, it's not the it, halides. Okay, halides have different uses and different importances, okay? They have different uses and different importances. So, again, in your situation, it may not be, let's say, as critical, okay? But, again, it's just understanding the difference in the light sources. Yeah, Alex, um, uh, Alex, how do you pronounce that? So he, um, he said, yeah, I'm talking about the Sigfloy, uh, S-F-I-L-I-G-O-I. You never heard of that, Tulio? No, really. That was um, that was an awesome uh, fixture. Um, crumb, crumb dad, <laughs> crumb dad, dumb. I think is the uh, the user. I got one. Yeah, I I wish I still had mine. You know, that was kick ass fixture. Um, so Tulio, the um, I got to work on a couple of questions from a um, um, an awesome guy, Dongzo who's been on my show a couple of um, times. He's a scientist, and he, uh, he runs a little company called Acro Garden. But he, he was in the pharmaceutical business, and he did a lot of uh, research, coral research. And, and uh, he's a fascinating guy, and, and people love, uh, love hearing uh, Dong uh, speak and, and talk on the, uh, on the show. But he had a couple of questions for you that I wanted to rattle off to you. And these are, uh, these are about T5s. And I want to get back to, uh, to metal halides again. I've got some more questions for you about metal okay. halides. But, um, so here's a couple of questions from Dong about T5s. And it's, it's talking about UV also. He's wondering about UV. Um, so his question is, first one is, I'm wondering how much UV leaks out from T5. Does, you know, T5 does use UV to excite the coating to generate light. So the whole T5 tube is filled with UV. And there may be some UV leak out of um, the T5. Bulb. So, based on what you know, Tulio, is is there any uh, leakage from from a T5 bulb with UVA? UVA. You will get UVA. You will definitely get UVA. And then again, depending on the the phosphor composition, lamp uh, lamp the the glass, not only the glass itself, but the impurities in the glass. Because remember, that's what absorbs UV. Okay, all those little minute details, and it makes a difference. But most of the UV is, in fact, absorbed. Even in claims, even in lamps claiming to produce UV, most of the UV is, in fact, absorbed by the phosphorus and the glass itself. There will be UVA leakage, absolutely. Nothing like, let's say, a halide or other sources, but there will be leakage. But see, the other difference is with a T5 lamp, 
the way their energy is produced, it's very diffuse. It's very diffuse. For example, Keith, I, I don't know if you remember this, but back in the old days when we were doing watts per gallon, yeah. remember how we were told that the effective penetration of fluorescence was about 24 inches? Yeah. Okay, it's because the light is just so diffuse. Okay, so it's the nature of the source. But yeah, there's there's some there's some there's some UVA, UVB. I don't know. I'd have to test for that. Okay. Um, and his other question is um, also there are UV T5 bulbs available for reptiles. I'm wondering what happens if we put a UVB bulb in a T5 fixture. Will that be a good experiment to test? you know, out how corals respond to UVB. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. And I could get Joy in here. I could get Joy in here to confer this, but so the last Aquashella, Joy was at Aqua. I don't know. Keith, have you ever heard of that show, Aquashella? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well, you're a reef guy, so I don't know, <laughs> fresh water and stuff. But anyway, so Joy went to Aquashella, and she had one of our UVB, UVA, XHOs at the show. And she brought it just to show some friends, okay? And one of those friends was Jake Adams. And Chris Meckley can confirm this story. So Chris, if you're listening, he can confirm this. So what Jake did, he measured our UVB and UVA light. And after he was amazed at the UVB and UVA energy that it did produce, to debunk he went around and he started measuring many of these devices that claim to produce UV with our meters. Jake took the measurements and he had it all on his phone. Unfortunately, when he passed away, that was all gone. Mm. But he was going to show people how a lot of these sources claiming to produce UV were producing little or nothing at all. And Chris, if I'm lying, please, because you were there. He said, uh, Chris said, yeah, I was there with Jake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, another thing that, um, I didn't mention that might be a consideration in terms of my comparison between the, the, the Mitras and, and running halides is the ballast that I'm running for the, uh, for the halides. And that is an electronic ballast, right? So, and, right. and back in the day, everybody liked to run their metal halide bulbs, specifically the 400 watt 20k radium bulbs, with a magnetic ballast to overdrive the bulbs to generate more intensity. What um, so could that come into play, Tulio, in terms of getting less par values on a metal halide bulb that's running on an electronic ballast versus a magnetic ballast? Yes and no, and here's why. Yes and no, and here's why. It has to do with things like lamp temperatures and other things like that. And, and, and here's what I mean. So if you start with a typical metal halide lamp, the, the arc tube inside, it's set at X number of atmospheres when the lamp is, it's basically internal pressure, yada, yada. And, and, and it's a big factor in, in, in how it produces light and otherwise and, and, and what have you. So now what happens is I'll use the old, remember the old ice cap ballasts? Yeah for the VHO lamps. Yep. Remember how they used to overdrive the lamps? Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. The energy you were investing in overdriving the lamp was increasing the lamp temperature, causing the lamp to produce less light, not more. Hmm. See, more power isn't always better. Okay, so there's one. And two, we've done, I have a spectral, I, I should, I'll do it again. I, where I took a stock 250 watt metal halide lamp and compared it to a, radi a radium lamp. And you should still get X amount of energy expressed. Now, if I'm gonna overdrive it by 30%, well, I'm gonna use more power and this, that, and the other thing, but the lamp could be designed perfectly fine that it doesn't need to be overdriven, okay? That was an old wives' tale from back when, I'm sorry. It has to do with the efficacy of way the way you're distributing that energy. And, and, and actually, Keith, you're going to laugh about this. Because of some of the critical applications that we do now have, we are, in fact, back in production with energy-efficient magnetic ballasts. Right. Why did, why did manufacturers stop manufacturing magnetic ballasts? Expense. Too heavy? Too heavy. Too heavy? Shipping. Shipping. 
just shipping the parts and components. The transformers, the, 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 they're just a little heavy. Now, the newer ones, the newer ones are smaller, they're lighter, they're more energy efficient. But yes, they're magnetic ballasts. We're pretty excited about those. Um, um, and, and again, because there are applications out there where metal halides are still important, regardless of, of, of you know, how some people may feel about that. So what would be the the top reason then to run a bulb with a magnetic ballast versus an electronic ballast? I just find magnetic ballasts more reliable in terms of consistency. What do you mean by that? Less moving parts. Electronic ballast, I mean, you got all these electronics and all this other stuff and just, just, did just a ton more parts. Whereas a magnetic ballast is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So you know, you and I talked about this. I have a couple of um, um, older sunlight supply magnetic ballast, dual magnetic ballast that I used to use um, years ago to overdrive those uh, 400 watt 20k radiant bulbs. And I and I you know those ballasts were great, very reliable, blah blah blah. Um, a few years ago, like maybe five years ago, I, I dusted them off. I, um, I set them up and um, about six weeks, four weeks into it, the, um, the, the, the bulbs turned off. You know, the, the, ball, the, 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 ball, the, yeah. the ballast still worked, but the bulb just shut down, right? And then um, I, you know, I started back up, bulb is fine, and then it shuts down. Are, you know, and I, and I saw a theory on on uh, online, and and you know, s sometimes speculation online, you can't really uh, buy into it. But um, what I what I read, and I don't know if this has uh, got any validity or not, is that the um, the way they're manufacturing the iridium bulbs these days, they're not meant to be over. I mean, I guess they were never meant to be overdriven in the first place. But no. perhaps something changed with the bulb, whereas they cannot be overdriven like they were in the past. Right. Because the ballast still seems to be good. I mean, it's not the capacitors. I mean, the ballast still works. I mean, I just recently fired up the, um, you know, the bulbs on, on um, that magnetic ballast. I tried it out. It still works. But the bulb right. can't handle it. Right. Is that is that a concern if you're going to be... It could be, yeah. It could. Listen, if you, if, if you, you can... Uh, so, for example, if the lamp temperature gets hot, too hot, the lamp will shut down. So that if your lamp temperature gets too hot, your lamp temperature will shut down. Right. So that could be the case. Yeah. Right. Um, Chris says that uh, magnetic ballast drive the bulb consistently without the surges that electronic ballast delivered to the bulb itself. Yeah, electronic ballast, basically, it's, it's no different than like the old electronic, well, the, the same electronic ballast of today. It's all, it's all frequency. It's all frequency. Whereas with magnetic ballast, you, there's very little moving parts between the voltage coming from your outlet to that lamp. And, and the lamps just seem to love them, especially halides. So why, why do you see electronic ballast? And, I, and my electronic ballast um, have this setting, and yours don't, I don't believe. But there's a uh, kind of like a, a super lumen setting where you can overdrive the uh, bulb using an electronic ballast. <laughs> Hype. Hype. Sounds pretty cool, right? Yeah. Super lumen. Right. Sounds pretty cool. Are we turning down our LED fixtures? Do we overdrive our LED fixtures? I don't think so. See, back then, see, here's the comedy, Keith, and that's why I made the comment. And like I said, no offense, like even with the 20K stuff and all this other stuff, see, but that's the running joke with this stuff is that um, and, and I've stated this. If you look up the OSHA standard, and Keith, are you familiar with OSHA? I've heard of them. Yeah, some, some people might have heard of OSHA. They set the safety standards and a lot of the standards in your IEC, International Engineering Commission, which is a global commission, okay? So it, it's basically internationally agreed upon that once we get to about 10,000 K, light is blue. It's blue. So how do we have 20K? Because what you're calling 20K still looks kind of white to me. When it's overdriven. 
Well, yeah, but even when it's not being overdriven, there's enough white there. It's definitely not blue like an XHR. You're right. You're right. Yep. So scientifically, that's what 20K would be. Yeah. Even if it was a color correlated temperature, it would be a saturated color. We wouldn't see that. But what happened was back in the early days of halides, if 65K was cool, then 8,000K had to be better. And 10,000K had to be better than that. Well, and then 14,000K had to be better than that. And 20K had to be better than that. And ironically enough, every single one of them light sources would still measure in terms of actual Kelvin, in terms of actual Kelvin, differently than claimed. Yeah. And that's what we need to understand. So, for example, Keith, and, and people can put this to the test. Go to Lowe's or Home Depot tomorrow and look for a cool white fluorescent lamp and let me know what the color temperature is. It's going to be about 5,000 K. And that's already white. Yeah. Cool white, in fact. Yeah. I guess aquariums, we use different, uh, you know, either we didn't get the memo or we use completely different standards or, or just Kelvin is different for aquariums. Yeah. Um, Chris at ACI says, I run magnetic ballast with radium 400 watt without issues, uh, 250 as well. Yeah, you know, it, it, there could be something with my ballast. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they're old. Sunlight supply, they're old. And they're big and heavy. Oh, those things are boat anchors. I remember those things. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, those are boat anchors. You know, Alex Correa said he, the, the first time he ever contacted me was to buy the uh, that fixture I was talking about. And he said it's pronounced S. Um, S. Fligo. S. Fligo. I, I don't know if that's, uh, I'm probably butchering that, but um, yeah. Um, oh, there was another question uh, that I wanted to, uh, it was a quick question by somebody else. And uh, what was the question here? Oh, yeah. Ari had this question. This is kind of like a, um, uh, a question in terms of what light to use for a particular tank. So, Tulia, what would you recommend for lighting if somebody had, let's say, a 40 gallon cube mix reef versus a 120 gallon SPS tank? Would you push for metal halides on these smaller tanks? Well, here's the thing. I've had plenty of people successfully use halides. In, in fact, my old Planet Aquariums tank was a 120. And I had two, I think I ran 175s on there because I really didn't need that much. But I had two 175s on that tank and that tank rocked. I didn't have any temperature issues or nothing like that. Um, in fact, at the behest of joy, I finally added some XHOs so that people could see me using the XHOs on the tank. Uh, but if it was up to me, I would have just left the halides on there too. The coral seemed to do fine. Um, but listen, for 40 breeders, again, it depends on the type of corals you're trying to grow. You know, it depends on the type of corals. Now, here was the interesting thing that I did find. For any guys out there, Keith, are dark mall uh, still a thing? The polyps, the dark mall, they call them dark malls or something. Any of your viewers ever heard of those things? They were uh, they were a polyp. It was a big deal coral. It was really expensive. Uh, are you talking about zoas? Yes. Okay. They are talking about them. Yeah, some dark mall, Zoe, or whatever. Yeah. Well, I had a guy, and apparently these were a big deal. And they used to melt on people quite frequently. Yeah. And I had a guy that, for some reason, they loved halides. Certain corals, just like it. Think about zoas. Keith, where are most zoas naturally found? In very shallow waters. Yeah. Very shallow waters. Yep. They would love halides. Now, you're not going to get all the glow. But here's the interesting thing that people don't realize, Keith. And this brings up a good point that I want to make sure that we leave tonight with, too, is that even though you see those zoas under, let's say, the white light of sunlight, the fluorescence is still there. It's just being canceled out by the other wavelengths of light to your eye. If you subtracted those wavelengths that coral would be fluorescing and glowing. Okay, that coral would in fact be fluorescing and glowing. So, so the thing is, is that you, you said this earlier when you said 20K spectrum, right? No, 20K, put it this way, Kelvin is expression color correlated temperature. It says color correlated, not spectral correlated. 
It's color. So when we say 10K, when we say 20K, when we say blue, when we say blue, we're still speaking in terms of color. We're still speaking in terms of color. Because if I said blue, there's a whole band of light in terms of spectral power distribution that comprises blue light. Gotcha, man. So, uh, Tuli, you've been very kind to uh, just have a very general open discussion about lighting, and we haven't talked really um, much at all about Reef Bright. What, um, any, anything you could share exciting and new about uh, what's coming down the pipe for uh, Reef Bright? Any new products out there? We actually, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not at liberty to speak about it at the oh, moment. Oh, it's a secret. But, but we do have some cool stuff. We do have some cool stuff coming down the pike. Seriously, we do have some cool stuff coming down the pike. And like I said, Keith, I just want people to understand, and I think you would agree with this, Keith. I don't care if it's a light, if it's a pump, if it's a th It's hard to say that there is a best. It really depends on application, usage, just so many, you know. So the thing is, is rather than focusing on that, like I said, let's look at the differences between the light sources. Let's look at the differences between these light sources and start asking those questions because that's how our hobby really advances. I, There's no question that they're different. I'd love to see the uh, the side by side experiments in terms of how the corals react to the different lights in the exact same conditions, but just the, the light source being different. Well, but here's the thing, though, Keith, what are we calling reacting? And what I mean by this, what I mean by this is that that blue tank, if that's what the goal is, OK, then you're going to get different pigments from a halide. But interestingly enough, you're going to get other fluorescent pigments from halides that you wouldn't normally, let's say, get from different light sources. It, 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 it's a slippery slope when, you, can't, when you say but, the but can't you just try to match the color of the uh, the LEDs so the halide as best as possible? Can, can you just try to do that versus just go uh, heavy blue? No, or... you can't. Here's the thing. No, you can't because spectrally it would still be completely different. And that's what I meant by that's what I meant by no disrespect to Telegram, but it's just scientific fact, physics, that if you would if you would if you would be observing the absolute irradiance as you adjusted the color to the appearance of the human eye, because that's what color is. It's to the appearance of the human eye. OK, the signature would still be completely different. And what that means, we don't know. Gotcha. We don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Tulio, dude, you've been very, very generous with your time. Uh, I, we're going to, we're going to wrap it up. Any, uh, any final thoughts, my friend? No, well, I'll tell you what, we're looking forward to going to Reef of Blues. Huh? I hope some of the folks are uh, going there as well. Look forward to seeing there and, uh, make sure to stop by and see hi. you know, if you see me walking around and, uh, Looking forward to a great show this weekend. Cool. All right, Tulio, man. Well, listen, dude, thank you so much for uh, for being back on the show. It's always uh, very educational for me and all the viewers out there. No worries, Keith. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you having me on, man. Everybody have a good evening. Yep. I also want to thank the uh, the, the sponsors, Bulk Resupply and Ecotech Marine, for uh, sponsoring and supporting the show. And I also want to thank all you folks out there for tuning in tonight and and um, contributing to the chat and um, asking those questions. Also, a big thank you to Paul, who is the moderator, as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to this hobby. Um, yeah. I also want to let you know that all episodes of Rabbit with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Rapping with Reef Bum live stream will be Next Thursday, April 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Moki Chow. The inappropriate reefer will be in the house, so that should be another ah. another great show. And if you want to check out yep. the full upcoming schedule of guests, it's a great slate of guests there, Tulio. They're coming up on the show, so go. No, listen, they definitely have to check out next week's uh, next week's uh, show. That's going to be a yeah, good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can, cool. you can see the whole lineup at reefbum.com under the YouTube section. So until next time, be safe and be well. Later.